Thank you, Martin. Uh, what you forgot to mention is, and that's also the reason why um, this moment is very flattering for me, is that I've studied um, in, the, in the studio of Wolf, and Stefan and I have both uh, spent many years there. Since studying in my times mean, me meant that you were there for seven to eight years. So uh, uh, it's a great honor also to speak uh, after Wolf. And um, as you can imagine, being educated um, not only by such an internationally recognized educator, by, uh, but also by uh, such an enthusiastic building architect, uh, you have to become a building architect, or at least you have to try yourself. And that was what, um, what Wolf was always telling us, when as soon as you started your uh, diploma project, uh, he would say, so what is your last dream? before you enter reality. And he would really encourage you following your aspirations. And I think um, now that we, Stefan and I also become, have become teachers, we, we understand how, how difficult that is, that you really awake aspirations in students. So, um, well, and building is actually what we, we started with literally. So when we, uh, when we graduated, we uh, spent a uh, couple of years at Kup Himmelblau and we were working on this um, extremely complex and, and interesting international um, project or we got glimpses into the practice I would say as junior design designers but um, and so we left there with the self-confidence that we would start our own office and and start building and then we did a, a international competition an open one and we won it and uh, that was a big surprise for us and then we really had to start an office, we, we had to found one. And, uh, and this is uh, the project we then did in South Korea, it was the uh, main um, building for the, for the expo. And um, uh, as you can see, uh, it's, a, it's a permanent building, uh, it was built into the open water of a former industrial harbour, so you can see or probably you can see it there, it's uh, built on an old uh, breakwater uh, system and um, as you can imagine it is a very exposed building, not only spatially and, and uh, visually, um, but also in terms of environmental impacts. So we had to deal um, with uh, typhoons there, but also with the impact of ocean waves and sea water. And the idea was to put the, the exhibition, um, the theme exhibitions into these concrete cones. And as you can see, it, it was really uh, about this negotiation. And, and I think that's really what we were always interested in, in that, that you have a design intent, but then you negotiate with other constraints that evolve naturally. And that is, of course, the integrity of the structure, uh, the, the functions or the utilities, but also uh, in this case it was uh, the daylight, because after the expo um, we had to provide openings for an after use. So uh, during the expo they were covered. So the topic was really to negotiate all these constraints in a, in a very complex um, um, uh, structural system of these thin concrete shells. And I would say it's, it's exactly not this optimization because that would all be based on objective um, parameters, but rather it's a negotiation of your design intent. And, and if you're lucky, then the output is something more, is something that adds up to it, that creates a new solution to things. So towards the other side, uh, we had a completely different uh, situation. We had a, a, a facade that was very long, 125 meters, and that was facing the expo's main uh, axis and the main entrance. And uh, as you know from all the expos, expos usually have these media facades going on, and so our idea already during the competition was to have an analog media facade. So to say that architecture itself um, becomes the choreography, so to do a facade with analog, the analog means of movement. And we were de uh, developing that with a very great um, uh, engineers, and I should uh, discuss this bottle of champagne issue with him, uh, with uh, uh, Knippers Helwig uh, from Stuttgart. And um, so we were really extremely lucky that uh, with this project we could propose something that was also a novel facade. So it's all based on uh, material uh, performance. And the idea was that 
when we um, made the competition, we were suggesting that we would have a gently swaying facade that would be seamlessly moving. So you would see no hinges, uh, no joints. So the idea was not to, to propose a technical device, but really an architectural uh, element. Um, and in the end, I think we managed to create this synthesis of uh, geometry, material performance, movement, and uh, and, and spatial experience. So y the principle is actually rather simple. You see this, the strips, they're up to 15 meter long and nine millimeter thin. They're GFRP, uh, fiber reinforced polymers. And what you see is that they are hold on four points and two of them are slightly moved by actuators. And this very little movement causes this beautiful side rotation that comes out of the elasticity of the material. And actually, fabrication was a quite a simple uh, process, and it's something that is really uh, very common in, in Korea because they build all these uh, yachts there. And actually, um, since all the lamellas have the same radius, we were able to use the same uh, negative form, a formwork for, for fabrication. So we could also do that to, for a reasonable um, price. So the actual fabrication at that time was I would say rather low tech. What was really new and innovative wa was a new approach in uh, in design and in engineering. The new, because also for engineers it was a very unconventional way of thinking. Because usually engineers are trained to create stiff elements and not elements that bend. So I think what we what we wanted to achieve is to combine the sensational with the sensation. So something that's really new, that speaks of the exposed agenda of, of creating an innovative, non-mechanical facade that's based on, on material performances, but also that speaks to people's emotions and sensations. That, uh, and it was really that effect that when people saw these seamlessly swaying uh, facade suddenly opening, that they even started applauding because it's uh, something where you can't see the cause of the effect that, that causes um, something like, maybe we could call it a little wonder. Um, so we are, we are both teaching and uh, before we got this uh, professorship for structure and design, uh, because we have this interest in, in structural um, um, issues, we were uh, also testing um, prototypes with our students at the TU in Vienna. And so the next two uh, projects I'm showing are actually projects that are between the academic uh, realm and, and our practice. And um, with this pr uh, project we were, or installation in the Mark in the Museum of Applied Arts in Vienna, we were again dealing with elasticity. And um, in when we when we think of structure or material performance, we always mean more. We always want to widen the concept because um, structure in the end is an experiential uh, quality for us. So we're really interested in the becoming of structures, in how they emerge and how, what perceptual patterns they evolve and how they communicate uh, with, with, with us as humans and with our perception. And so elasticity is not only um, uh, material performance and a way to do a structure, but also, of course, a spatial transformation, a movement again. So this is how the installation um, spread it in the in the gallery. As uh, you can see, it uh, divided the space and created these niches and pockets where um, people could um, uh, immerse. And uh, we had this uh, branching system, so we were looking um, for a way to scale down these cells. We created these um, flippable cells out of these um, fibers. And, and we were looking for a way to scale them down so that they would be stiff and then really turn into this, this fine and subtle uh, um, cells that would almost um, dissolve in space. And there you see this gradient of space. And uh, the idea was that people would really uh, touch it and they were able to collapse it uh, with their hands. So how these geometrical systems and these material systems interfere with uh, with the visitors of the gallery was was really uh, interesting for us to see. The next project um, <coughs> was also an invitation 
beim Museum in Vienna, das ist dann das Museum Belvedere oder 21. Haus. And um, they have this uh, courtyard in a, I would say, neo-modernistic uh, ensemble. So you see a, a, the former expo pavilion by uh, Schwanzer that was uh, brought back to Vienna and put here into a, a new ensemble by uh, Krishanitz. And um, when we were asked to do a summer pavilion for the courtyard that would be there for uh, three months, we were thinking of a, of a counter position to the to this autonomy of modernity to this closeness if you want and we were uh, thinking of Georges Bataille's idea of the formless um, because also that was used as a counter concept to criticize the autonomy and the, uh, and rather propose something that's open-ended uh, and much more bottom up and low and that can uh, as it is described um, be squashed everywhere and cannot be described does not create um, hierarchy or rule. Um, the other idea was also that we would put, let's say, the idea of order or rule into the particle itself, so that we would not have an overarching geometrical system, but rather have a very informed um, element that would create then really a bottom-up structure. So we were really interested in this emergence of structure here. And uh, with students, we were looking at felt and dust, and as you can see here, the table of dust particles, you also see uh, a spiral, and that was then the element we were using. In terms of structure, what's fascinating for us is here that there is no detail, there are no joints. It's just the spirals that are entangled, that hold together by friction and by tension. And um, th that's a very interesting structural system that has not been exploited that much. You all know, of course, uh, Konrad Wachsmann is very famous, but uh, still it's something that is neglected, th this, this um, structures without joints, without detail. So the spirals we were then uh, creating are increasing the pitch towards their middle. So when you arrange them or assemble them, uh, they create a pre-tensioned uh, structure. And uh, actually they had a really interesting uh, performance. And we were testing digital ways and analog ways uh, of assembly. But in the end, the only way to really deal with it was really to have students who were already experienced and who knew the system and who could intuitively uh, assemble it. So the digital model rather became a way of prognosing uh, the result. But I think that's what we are architects doing. We are constantly modeling um, reality or unrealities or fictions of realities, as David Rui was today mentioning. But what we're doing is we're constantly creating these reductions of reality in order to focus on certain aspects. And so every model, might it be the analog prototype or the digital model, the digital analysis, is always focusing on certain aspects and then has its certain, its specific insights. And these then uh, inform the next model, analog or digital. And what was really interesting is that sometimes you find this correspondence and um, the, the vagueness that the the actual uh, spatial prototype or the physical prototype had uh, was also, uh, we could also observe in the structural analysis and that became very interesting because the structure has many contact points and that's how this pretension system evolves. But um, as soon as the input of forces changes, this contact point change changes. So they are in a constant flux. So this, um, this vagueness or this formlessness uh, is also in the system itself. And that was, for us, it's always really interesting when the, the performance of the structure corresponds uh, with the spatial and visual effects it has. So that was the, the, the structure there. It was uh, quite interesting with students to build up. It was uh, nine meters high. Uh, and um, of course, this uh, idea of aggregation, so maybe we could also today probably would call it discrete elements, uh, is also something, a track or an interest that we follow in our practice um, um, since the beginning. So this is a very early project. Uh, it's a competition we won. So actually we did, we won the first two competitions and since then we haven't won any, so, but that's, that's another story. But this was our second competition we did and we won and this was for a uh, traveling um, art pavilion for the federal country Salzburg. And um, 
here again the idea was not to create a, p a structure but rather have something uh, have the structure evolve. So we were thinking of a system that would, mm, in a bottom-up way, uh, create rather a flickering mass. And uh, the idea was also because it was um, for the Salzburg Biennale, a music festival for contemporary music, that, um, that the structure itself would also be um, um, a structure that would, at first sight, seem very strange, but the more you um, um, encounter with it, the more it unfolds uh, its, lo its logic, like contemporary music does. So you see here, again, we had a um, very great uh, cooperation with uh, uh, engineers, and this time Bollinger, Grohmann, uh, Schneider, and um, you can also again see on the right-hand side how we evolved the project. So it's really not the linear process anymore of, of uh, having a concept, uh, creating the geometry, evaluating, and then thinking about fabrication, but it was all really happening at once. So we were always testing ideas, testing design ideas, evaluating it, uh, thinking, talking to the to the um, fabricators, and in the end, what we had is this model where we simultaneously architects and engineers can simultaneously uh, push the sliders and. Um, I would say it's again a negotiation within the framework, but also with a clear design intent. And the parameters that are in that model are, or the three main parameters are the reduction of uh, connection points, because that's the reduction of cost. Um, then the reduction of deflection, of course, that's a structural behavior. Uh, and then um, a, a, a variation of angles. And that's this mass effect. So in order to achieve this, very heterogeneous structure, we had to make sure that angles do not repeat. So the design intent is always an important factor during this negotiation uh, instead of optimization process. What was also nice to see is that when the pavilion traveled through these different um, countrysides and, and also Maribor, and it was also in, in Slovakia, it always changed the reading not of itself, but also of, of the context it was in. and. Um, that was its original um, uh, point of assembly, this, the historic city center of Salzburg, where it was really nice to see that it was housing contemporary music next to Mozart. And, and of course, Mozart would have completely liked that because Mozart left Salzburg because he thought that contemporary uh, music is neglected. Um, so we like to test our interest in different scales and in different materials. This was a piece we did for a show by Peter Neuver in Vienna. It's a very tiny uh, piece, but again, here we tested the effect of color, uh, how you would change the reading and the perception of these formations. And then we also tested it in a competition. And that's always what we're really interested in, uh, to look for applications, because in the end, we want to we want to have something that has also functionalities uh, and, of course, performances. So uh, we were uh, so proposing a redesign for the tube station in Vienna, and we were thinking of, uh, of uh, using the ceiling, because uh, the ceiling is uh, actually a very important element in the underground station. It, it, it carries a lot of information layers already, and so we were thinking of a system that could have light and speakers um, that would also be a guiding system through colors, but that could also solve certain uh, problems that the tube stations in Vienna have. And one is the uh, fine dust particles, and, and the other thing is that they have a very problematic acoustic situation. So these poles were also filters for dust particles and for um, acoustic um, reasons. So. Uh, we were creating this mapping of these different functionalities, and then the, they would be integrated into this field. Yeah, of course, we did not win this one either. So the idea of um, integral design is something that's really important for us, and this is um, a proposal for a, a passenger terminal, actually for three passenger terminals in one in Kinmen in Taiwan. And uh, the reason why we are often looking into natural um, examples is not because we want to copy nature or we think that that is possible at all, but because sometimes these formations you can observe there already integrate many 
um, many functional layers uh, and, and do that in a very um, elegant and, and, and seamless uh, way. And so we were looking at these repetitive uh, patterns uh, of ribbles and we were thinking how to apply that for the terminal because the terminal needed to have a cross circulation in one direction but then an articulation of the individual terminals in the other one. So um, it became this kind of relaxed skin that was wrapping around and creating a topography. So there you see the three terminals <coughs> in, in one continuous topography uh, and, and the idea was to have a gradient, very translucent and light skin that would um, also have water as a main feature because uh, Kinman is a very dry island, it hardly ever rains and so water is a really precious resource. And we were thinking of really bringing that into the design and making that visible and experience uh, uh, tangible for, for, for people uh, to come there. So we were looking at systems for dewatering and creating these ponds with waterfalls for microclimates, but also having these uh, little purification cells as an element of the skin so that it really becomes a deep skin with many layers um, that also all have a, um, a functional um, a reason. And also the structure consists of these layers. And so it's, um, again, the negotiation, the analysis of the, of the the various inputs or the solar inputs and that then result in this heterogeneous uh, skin or this gradient ephemeral wrapping of the terminals. So <coughs> we are really interested in, in the performance and in the hidden uh, force flows and, and we are always um, you know, we are always very uh, sad if we if we hide that or if we just cover that with material. And we we are really we are always thinking of how can structure become an expressive quality? How can structure uh, communicate uh, to to people? And um, therefore, we were doing this uh, bridge and uh, design a proposal for a new Thames Bridge uh, in London, and we were looking looking uh, looking at that. Sorry. We were looking at that um, patterns of force flows, of inner force flows that occur. And actually, they're extremely beautiful and extremely interesting, very complex. Uh, and so we were then setting up a design process where we were looking at these, let's say, inner conditions and outer conditions of the bridge. So here you see the, the bridge layout, and of course, you have many requirements for a bridge. You have a spanning width, you have um, a certain uh, um, clearance that you have to keep for the ship traffic, but you also have uh, the, the various circulation paths with the inclinations. And, and so from that, we got these kind of outer framework for, for the bridge, and then we were overlaying this with the, with the inner, inner conditions and the inner force flows. And we were then bringing that to the outside again and creating this uh, expressive structure that is also important since in London, you might know that bridges are really high then on the second or third story even uh, of buildings. And so the, the bottom side is really a very important experience, an urban, um, ex a spatial experience in the city. And, and so that was also, um, it actually became the main side uh, of the bridge. And um, so to round that up, I, I just going to show you the latest thing we were doing again, a little proposal um, for the Oceanarium in Lisbon. Um, it was really nice because here we were approached by an artist um, who was doing um, an installation about the sea life in Portugal. And um, what is interesting that uh, this, this topic keeps coming back to us and so we were uh, we were thinking how we could do an envelope that would create a very contained interior because uh, her installations have to be completely shut off from any disturbance through light or sound but on the other hand bring that uh, interior to the exterior again so creates um, um, a structure that would really mingle interiority and exteriority and so we were looking at um, an envelope and how to dissolve that and create a, a zone of transition uh, uh, or exchange between the interior and the exterior. And that's also 
how we like to work when we when we do a, a proposal that we have this model and various level of control uh, and and various focuses on different aspects that we think that are important and they might be geometrical and spatial experiential but they could also be about directionalities of the geometry that might then become important for a structure or for fabrication. So um, this is the, the setup that the artist uh, wanted to have. So it's a multiple screen installation, a, a dark space. And, and this is then the layout that we were proposing. So it's this um, waiting zone, then a transition zone um, for kids to play, because of course in an oceanarium, uh, they are mostly kids and families, and then this gradually immersion uh, into the dark uh, video installation space. And this is how it looked, very playful of course, and as you can see the white surfaces would be the inside that turns to the outside where she was imagining to have sound and scent emanating, uh, while a colorful area would be the outside uh, that would guide you then uh, into the, the structure. And um, I would like to end uh, my uh, shorter talk today uh, with the alchemists because uh, I truly believe in experimentation and in innovation and, and I think that's uh, what we as architects should be doing. But I also think uh, that we should always be free to speculate and we should also be free to choose our methods and they might be uh, they, or they should be creative and they should not be scientific. And I think that's also why for an architect it's important to think about issues like structure, but do it from, a, from an architectonic uh, viewpoint. Uh, since the in the end I think we are totally working in the domain of the subjective uh, and of the creative. And in the end uh, we cannot measure it, we can only experience it. Thank you.